let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. What subpooling is? Look, it's a square. Isn't that cool? So, where does uh, your refrigerant from your compressor go into the condenser? Does it go into the top or into the bottom? To the top. Uh, it goes into the top, right? So your refrigerant goes into the top, and then it basically does this with multiple rows and multiple passes, and it comes out the bottom, right? So, what do you have going in the top of your condenser? What type of refrigerant is it? High High pressure. What's the temperature like? Spicy. 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 Very jiggly. High pressure, high temp, vapor. Is it superheated, subcooled, or at saturation? Superheated. Superheated, right? Because if it's fully vapor, it has to be superheated. All right. All right, what comes out the bottom? Subcooled. So it's still what pressure? High pressure. High pressure. High pressure. So cool. And the temperature is about what? Yeah, so it's slightly warmer. Warmer than ambient. Look at that. Man, look at that uh, penmanship. My mom really did well in teaching me. Yeah, um, that right. That's, that's good. Homeschooling did me well. Um, all right, so it's going in here. It's coming out here. Now, there's three different uh, kind of states that the refrigerant goes through in the condenser. What are the three? What are the three states or the three phases of the condenser? So, well, they're the, the sensible latent on the inside. Absolutely. Um, here, is that true? This, you're talking about sensible. So this this top portion is going to be superheated, right? And so we are going to be the role of this part of the condenser here is to de-superheat. And that's the sensible part. So the role here, if you're looking at your PT chart or you're looking at your gauge, whatever, you know, now they use PT charts or even old school gauges, so I don't know how to talk about this stuff. You're looking at measure quick, right? Um, and you look at that pressure on the on discharge coming out of the compressor. Now we don't have a port there, but it's about the same as liquid. It's a little bit higher than liquid. Um, you're gonna see that it doesn't correlate. The temperature of the refrigerant is actually higher than what you're seeing on the gauge if you look over at that temperature. And that means that it's superheated. It's heated above saturation, right? Which means it's fully vapor. So the first part is to get it to the point that it starts condensing. So to drop that sensible temperature until it starts to change uh, to a liquid. And that's the middle part of the condenser, which is the vast majority. It's kind of fun. If you take a thermal imaging camera and you get a good shot of a condenser, you'll see exactly this, bright red, all about the same in the middle, and then a little bit cooler down at the bottom. And that's how they should always look. It actually might be fun, yeah. fun, uh, to take a thermal imaging camera and look at one of these while you're in the process. And kind of walk, take, some, take some shots, five minutes in, 10 minutes in, 20 minutes in, and just see if it starts stacking liquid. Because you'll be able to actually see what percentage of liquid is stacking at the bottom. If you look at the center, all the same temperature, right? And this, what's, what do we call this phase here? I'm going to write all the same temperature. Saturation. Saturation. What's another word for it in this particular case? Condensing. Condensing, exactly. Yeah, perfect. So that's what's happening in the center here. And then at the bottom here, what do we call this part? So cool. We call this the subcooling. And in fact, um, in refrigeration, they'll call the last couple of rows of the condenser the subcooling loop. That's just a dumb way that refrigeration guys like to call this stuff. But it's also part of the condenser. It's the part of the condenser that's now dedicated to sensible again. Now it's sensible below saturation. This is sensible above saturation, desuperheat, condensed, subcool. That's what happens in the condenser. And so what's happening here um, with 454B that's different than what we're used to? How would you, in, in these terms, how would you how would you sum that up? <coughs> it's not subcooling. It's getting a lot farther down before it actually fully changes state. Before it fully changes state, right? And if you're running zero subcool, what that means is that rather than right here us having subcooled fully liquid, we actually still have a liquid vapor mix. And why do we still have a vapor a vapor liquid mix? Well. What it, what it has to be with 454B, or what it primarily needs to be with 454B, is the fact that this is more of a blend than we're used to, okay? 
not not actually more of a blend because our 410A is actually 50-50. Uh, but for whatever reason, 410A had very little glide. It had very little difference. So what's happening is, is for some reason, the 1234YF and the R32 aren't, aren't coming together and acting as one. So when we're looking at this measurement, we're seeing more of one than the other. Now, why are we seeing more of one than the other in the bottom of the condenser? My guess is it's, there's probably a density reason. So you probably, what's happening is, is when this thing ships, it's stratifying in the condenser because all the refrigerant comes in this condenser, right? Mm -hmm. It's stratifying in here uh, with it being off. And then when you start the system up, you're getting a lot more of one than the other. And so this may actually be liquid, but we don't know because we're assuming when we look at the PT chart that it's perfectly mixed, right? But if it's not perfectly mixed and we're getting more than of one than the other, but how we would know is if we looked at it with a thermal imaging camera. Because if you look at it with a thermal imaging camera, it's not gonna be able to trick you. You're gonna see hot, the same cooler, right? And if you look and you see hot, the same cooler, it doesn't, at that point, you're, you're agnostic of pressure. So it has nothing to do with pressure, temperature relationships, it's all just temperature, right? And in fact, if you even took, if you guys ever used infrared temperature, uh, so infrared is, is basically thermal imaging, but it's just a single point, a much smaller point. The problem with any sort of infrared or thermal imaging or anything like that, is that anything that reflects off of it, like I give an example, if I was gonna to try to take a temperature, uh, if I set a mirror here, and I tried to take a temperature of it with a thermal imaging camera, I wouldn't be taking a temperature of that mirror. I would be taking a temperature of whatever that mirror is looking at, right? Does that make sense? Because it's looking at it's looking at thermal radiation, that's how it does it. Anything that's a little more reflective, like, like if you look at copper, it's like kind of shiny, right? So. If I shoot this with a thermal imaging camera or I shoot this with an infrared, some of it's gonna reflect off and I'm gonna be averaging any, anything else that that's reflecting on. Mm -hmm. So that's important to know. It's not that big of a deal though if you're looking at it with on a surface where everything is the same, right? Like where, so because there's no variation, it's not gonna be perfect, but it still is going to be comparatively, I'll be able to, I'll be able to see what I'm looking at, right? So uh, anyway, I think that's a good test too. We have thermal imaging cameras around, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for thermal though, if carrier, the condenser exterior would be fine enough, but with the Linux, because there's such fine veins, that should we then be putting a tent over it to then block any sunlight? Because on, on, on the Linux, um, you're just saying because you can't really see into it. Right. You can't really. Can you take a, can you take a side panel off? I mean, okay, there's because you don't have to screws see. to the top of it, so. You could, but it's just, again, system functionality. Again, like, I'm not expecting you to do this on every one. Right. Um, so even if you just did one just for fun, uh, you know, took the top off, took a side off, or multiple sides off, put it back on, just to kind of, like, mm -hmm. be able to see it a couple times. Because you're right, it would be hard. Same thing true with, like, a train. You know, it's really hard to see that that coil on a carrier. But again, like, I Linux may be worse for some reason. What that reason is, I don't know. But... But it's, the same thing is still true with carrier to some degree, right? You're still yeah. taking you a long time. My point just is, if what we learn is, <coughs> is that th it is actually subcooled. Mm -hmm. It's just that because of the PT relationship, we can't see it on our gauge. Well, then we're fine to leave it and let it ride. And then just come back later and, and do a double check at some point. And uh, if we prove that we have subcooling, we can even do that double check six months from now. As long as we, you know, we know that it's, it's definitely got subcool. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so all your, cause, cause again, I can prove subcooling. I can prove a condenser's working without any, without any um, gauges at all. All I have to show is, is that it, it's super heat, condensing, subcool. And the more up the subcool goes, the more likely it's overcharged, right? If we're stacking too much, that means that we're actually taking up too much space. And that means that our head pressure is gonna go up. That's the reason why when you overcharge a system, the head pressure goes up. It's because you're filling up more and more of the condenser with liquid, and so now you have less and less space to de-superheat and condense. So basically, you're making your condenser smaller because the rest of this is all taken up with liquid. And that's where people will wrongly, incorrectly say, well, hey, adding subcooling increases system efficiency. Adding subcooling mechanically, like they do in refrigeration, where they have a mechanical actual subcooler, it's actually a cooling capacity doing it, that, have, that works, but for us, when we're stacking more and more liquid, 
we're getting more subcooling just because we're raising the head pressure. Right? When you raise the head pressure, your condensing temperature goes up. And so now that's, there's two different ways you can you know, change those numbers. Right? You can drop a number or you can increase a number. And if you watch it, you got a system that's already got 10 degrees of subcool, whatever. You start adding more charge. It's not that the liquid line temperature goes down. It's that the head pressure goes up. And that's what increases that number. Does that make sense? So that's not adding efficiency. That's decreasing efficiency. That's increasing compression ratio. And if you were to watch it on, if you were to watch it on measure quick, as you start to overcharge the system, that's what you would see. You would see your head pressure going up. You would see your subcooling <coughs> going up. But you'd also watch your compression ratio going up, which is no bueno. High, higher than necessary compression ratio is like the worst. Compressor gets hotter. Uh, you know your oil lubricity is decreased. Uh, your your energy consumption goes up. I mean everything is worse when you have too much overcharge, and that's why when a manufacturer calls for 12 degrees of subcool. They're baking in a lot of things. Like if you were tuning, if you were tuning an air conditioner to like a car, like you know anybody into like fancy cars or like Japanese stuff. Okay, so people who really tune cars, what they're doing is they're getting right to the fine edge of the engine blowing up, right? Like you're you're constantly pushing it right to the edge. If I wanted to push an air conditioner to the edge, I would set it up so that I essentially had one degree of subcool left at the TXV. Right, one degree of subcool left right there, and one degree of superheat at the compressor. That would be a perfectly tuned system in terms of like uh, capacity and efficiency. But what's the downside to that? No no There's no wiggle room. Anything go, anything changes in the conditions, mm. and now you're off. Now you don't have one degree of subcool; you have zero. And as soon as you have zero, that means you no longer have a full column of liquid at your valve. And now you've lost your capacity. Same thing is true of superheat. One degree of superheat is great, but it goes to zero degrees of superheat, and now I have flood back to my compressor, right? And again, the problem is our, our tools aren't even accurate enough to measure within one degree. Four is realistic, even with the even with the digital tools we have now, because we're comparing a temperature clamp, which is reading on. Is the temperature clamp, clamp leak reading on the refrigerant on the inside of this tube? Nope. No, it's reading the copper on the outside. And those are not exactly the same. Those can be a degree off in some cases. Now, liquid line, not as much, but suction line, definitely. And so you have that effect. And then you have a temperature clamp, which could be one, two degrees off. And then you have a pressure gauge, which could be one, two PSI off easily. Right? By the time you get all said and done, four degrees is, is realistic. So if you have 12 degrees of subcool that you're reading, that could be 16, that could be eight. Of those two, which would I rather have? Eight. eight. Eight, there you go, right? So you're starting to get it. So do we wanna leave systems undercharged? Well, no, but if we have to do one or the other, a little more overcharged than the manufacturer says or a little more undercharged than the manufacturer says, we want a little more undercharged, right? Downside to that is, and this is a psychological problem, I say a psychological problem, not a mental problem, because that sounds that sounds worse when you say a mental problem. What happens is, as soon as the service techs know that you might be edging on a little bit on the side of undercharge, what they're going to do is they're going to go back to a system that's way undercharged, and they're going to say, oh yeah, well the installer just left it short, because they don't want to go find a leak, right? Finding a leak is a pain in the butt, and so that becomes then a pattern of like, oh no, I think the installer just left it short, charge it up, goes two months short again, charge it up, goes too much, short again, right? That's, that pattern becomes a real issue, especially with refrigerant being the way it is now. So we have to have a culture where you guys are nailing it. You're documenting really carefully. So if you left it at six degrees of subcool, but you did it for a reason, document it. Because then when the next guy comes out and it's got two degrees of subcool, he can't say, oh, well, the installer just left it you know, a little short, right? It's, you have to have that trust. Does that make sense? Because there's no, absolutely nothing worse. The worst thing is to ever leave a leak. Actually, the second worst thing is to leave a leak. The worst thing is to leave a leak and then keep going back and keep recharging it because you're too lazy to find the leak. And that's, that's just a pattern. And this, is, this happens when I was attacked. It's happened forever, and it will continue to happen. But culturally, um, this is what worries me about this paradigm that we're in right now. If you guys know you might be leaving it a little short on a subcool number, uh, because of the way the equipment's performing, you've got to be really clear about your why uh, in that. And it has to be accurate. You can't be, again, part of the beauty of, of Measure Quick is now you can't pencil with numbers and, and make things up, which that's a whole other whole story.
Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, hvacrschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast, available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.